Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 20. We're going to be looking at the first 22 verses together this morning. Um, again, happy Resurrection Day. Uh, as we think back about 2,000 years ago, as the first believers in Christ, the early Christians, arose this Sunday morning, it was a very somber, a very sad morning for them. Uh, the, the rabbi, the Messiah, the, the leader they had been following was crucified, was buried in a tomb. And, and maybe you're feeling kind of sad today, too. My hope is as we get to the end, as you'll see with the followers of Christ, they're filled with happiness. My hope is by the end you'll be filled with happiness as well to realize all that we have in and through Jesus Christ. But first, I need to let you know we're going to talk about an uncomfortable subject. No, not the other subject. We're going to talk about the subject of death. In survey after survey, I found that people are afraid of three things. Public speaking, death, and wild animals like spiders and snakes and crocodiles and bears and those kind of things. And, and as we realize... Uh, that death is going to come for all of us at one point. As we encounter the disciples of Jesus at this point, after the death of Jesus, we see they're afraid. Uh, they're, they're feeling hopeless. They're at a loss for words. And uh, they're filled with grief and sorrow. They, they had followed Jesus and left behind everything. And now... The last thing they know, he was crucified on a cross, and he's buried in a tomb. And so they're devastated. They had felt as death had crushed them, had devastated them. But before Jesus had gone to the cross, he told the disciples what was going to happen. But even before that, as he raised Lazarus from the dead, he delivered these hope-filled words to Martha and Mary. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And the truth is, death is not the end. There is a life after this life. And that's what I hope we'll look at today. The resurrection of Jesus proves that there is a life after this life. And my hope is as we take a look at this section together, we'll see that Christ offers us peace and he offers us hope in him. So with that, let's take a look at the first 10 verses together here in John chapter 20. We'll take a look at the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. We read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, they were going to the tomb, and so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lined with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place that by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again, to their own homes. We'll pause there. We see that this first day of the week, and for the Jews and for the early Christians, this was Sunday. This was the first day of the week, and, uh, and we see it was early in the morning. The, the Greek there is actually very early in the morning. And Mary, we see, comes to the tomb where Jesus had been placed, and and she must have been in for a shock in what she had, had, had discovered, what she had seen. And so she, she realizes that 
The stone has been rolled away. Something must have happened. And as I was thinking about that, what would that be like for us? I think it would be like us attending a funeral and, and going to the grave site and, um, and saying goodbye to our loved one. And then the next day we go back to visit the grave site and there someone's excavated, it's, it's unearthed and the casket's open and there's no one in there. You would think, what in the world happened? You'd be in a state of shock. And that's exactly what, what Mary is feeling here. And we see that she's in this, this genuine state of, of trying to figure out what, what occurred, what happened. And so she goes and finds Peter, and it says the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, that's John. That's, he's the one uh, writing this, this gospel. It's his uh, humble way of describing himself. And so we see that um, both Peter and John go, and, and so she tells them the, the body of Jesus is gone. Right, the stone in front of the tomb has been rolled away. And so uh, how, do, how do Peter and, and John react to this? Well, we see that they begin to both run to the tomb. And it's interesting here, verse 4, it, John tells us that he outran Peter. I'm not sure why he felt that was important for us to know, uh, but apparently it's important, uh, I think, in a sense that it shows um, these were just ordinary guys, ordinary guys that Jesus had called and and, and asked to follow him, and they gave up everything to follow. And I think at the same time, it shows the authenticity of the scriptures, um, that we realize that, that uh, the, the scriptures are true, right? You can realize that these guys were just guys like us. They're ordinary, but Jesus called them. And I think at the same time, we see that they ran because they eagerly wanted to be with Jesus. If it is true, I want to get there before you. I want to be closer to Jesus. I want to see him first. And so we see that uh, they run to the tomb, and we see John leans over, or he crouches down, and he, he looks, and he peers into that tomb. Yet he didn't enter in, and that's probably because from the Jewish mindset, to be uh, entered into a tomb for a Jewish person would make you ceremonially unclean. And so most likely he didn't want to enter that because he didn't want to be uh, unclean as a Jewish person. But I love that we see Peter, who, if you haven't read through the Gospels, you learn to love the character of who this guy is. Um, and uh, he just went right on in, didn't care if I'm unclean. And then he examined the linen cloths and saw the, the linen cloths that they had wrapped Jesus around in with the spices. Uh, they, they were no longer um, wrapped around a body. We see that he, he understands that they were folded neatly and that the this cloth that was around the head was folded and it was set aside. And, and that meant for them they knew one thing at least. This was not a grave robbery. This is not somebody that came to steal the body of Jesus. Right? If someone's going to break in your house and take something, they're not going to vacuum and do the dishes for you and make it look nice. Right? It doesn't, doesn't happen that way. So they realized if somebody took the body, they wouldn't have, have folded the linen cloths, right? Something unique, something remarkable happened here. We don't really understand what occurred, but we know that no one stole his body. And so they realized something absolutely unique had happened in this now empty tomb. And then we read John went in the tomb where Peter was already, and he saw and he believed as well. And so they both understood the body of Jesus was not stolen, but something else must have happened to the body of Jesus. And we see that both Peter and John did not know the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Now we looked at this in a previous study, uh, the prophet uh, Jonah, a picture of three days into the, the heart of the belly of the great fish. Jesus grabbed hold of that and said he would be in the earth for three days as well and that he would rise again. And there's a lot of prophecy, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Many scriptures in the Old Testament that point to the death and the resurrection of Christ. And even though Jesus, again, had told them many times this was going to happen, we're going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, the religious leaders are going to uh, uh, crucify me, and then I'm going to be rising from the third day. He told them many times this would happen, but it didn't make sense to them. Right? And for many of them, they thought the Messiah was going to overthrow Rome. He was going to be a political leader. And they didn't realize that 
Well, he will, but his second coming, he will come again and he will overthrow all the powers of the world. But his first coming was as a suffering servant, to be that perfect, unblemished, spotless lamb, that sin offering for you and for me. And so they went away to their own homes and they tried to process all these things that were going on. But we see next, a very special woman encounters messengers from heaven and she encounters our risen Lord. And we'll see that here in verse 11 through verse 18. It says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of the Lord, of, of where Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, that he had spoken these things to her. We'll pause there. We see Mary comes back to the tomb, and we see that she is looking into the tomb, and then all of a sudden she sees two messengers from heaven, two angels there in the tomb. Which is fascinating. It, it, we see one sitting at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been. And this is fascinating because for me, this is a, a reminder of how the New Testament fills the Old Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, God had instructed the Israelites to build an Ark of the Covenant. Right? We know that the Ten Commandments were inside, that uh, some of the, the manna they put in a jar, they put that inside, and then um, one of the leaders of the tribes uh, Aaron, his, his uh, rod, his staff had budded, and uh, they had budded some almonds and flowers, and so they put uh, that there as well. And so there was this uh, Ark of the Covenant, and on the top of this, there was a, uh, a lid that had two angels, two cherubim, two angels with their wings that covered over it. And, and once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and he would take the blood of a lamb and he would apply the, the, the blood to the top of that lid, and that was called the mercy seat. And he would apply that blood there, and the sins of the nation of Israel would be forgiven. It was a time where the people could have, uh, once again by faith, a right relationship with God through trusting that that blood atoned for their sins, that they were now at one with God. But the high priest had to do that year after year. But we see this picture that Jesus went to the cross for us, where he shed his life's blood for you and for me. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he was truly dead. Our sins truly killed him. And they placed him in that tomb. But we know on the third day he rose from the grave. And so here we see those angels, right, that are, that are there in the tomb. And so it's a, a good reminder for us that everything in the Old Testament points us to the New Testament. And in fact, everything in all of the scriptures points us to Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so we realize here that Mary is, is looking for Jesus. And we see she encounters the angels and they ask her, why is she crying? And she replies, because someone took away my Lord and I do not know where he is. She is seeking the Lord. And that's a good reminder for us that there are many things that we can seek in life. The thing we should really be seeking is the Lord. He should be first and foremost in our hearts and in our lives. Um, you can try and seek after 
health and wealth and fame and pleasure and all those things. And Solomon did that. He tried to, to seek all the things this world had to offer. And then he said it was vanity, vanity. It was emptiness. It didn't fulfill him. It didn't satisfy him. And his conclusion was, was to fear God, to essentially love the Lord, keep his word, keep his statutes, obey him, follow him. He, he set up guardrails. He wants to bless you. He wants you to walk in his way, to, to, to be obedient to him, to be a child of his. And, and we realize that that's where we find true satisfaction is knowing God, knowing the creator of the universe. We find our meaning and our purpose. We were designed by God and for God to have a relationship with him. And so we see that Mary is seeking Jesus. And as she encounters these angels, she hears this sound behind her. She turns and she sees a stranger. And she thinks it's the gardener. She thinks this is the caretaker uh, of this grove. And in that area, uh, they had olive trees. And so in this orchard or garden of, of these olive trees, uh, there's usually a caretaker that, that tends to these trees. And so she's thinking that it must be this individual. And so she's asking uh, who she thinks is the gardener, uh, do, you, do you know where he is? And if you do, tell me, and, and I will go. And, and so she's trying to figure out where is the body of Jesus. And yet little does she know the body of Jesus is right in front of her, that Jesus was right there. And we see that all it took was the voice of Jesus saying her name, Mary. Once Jesus said her name, everything changed. She realized it's Jesus. He's alive. And she realized he's right here. I don't have to be sorrowful anymore. I don't have to, I don't have to, to weep anymore. He's alive. And we see that she begins to cling to him, which is a good response, by the way. If somebody were to rise from the dead and you miss them, you want to give them a hug. You want to cling to them. And we see that's exactly what she does. She clings to our risen Lord. And we see in a moment everything changed in her life. Now she's set free from grief and she held tight to Jesus. I think God wants to do the same thing in our lives, the same thing in our hearts. He wants us to let go of our grief, let go of our sorrow, let go of our fear and our sin and our shame. He wants us to hold tightly to him. He wants us to cling to him. And so if there are things in your life that are pulling you away from God, let go of those things. Seek the Lord. Cling to him. Find life and meaning and purpose in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we see that there's forgiveness. There's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now at this point, Jesus said to her, go and tell the others I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And in saying this, Jesus point out that as his followers... We can now say that God is our Father. We have a Heavenly Father, and Jesus is our Savior and our risen Lord. Again, this is not talking about religion, man trying to do works to appease God or to climb the ladder of how much nice things and good things we can do to try and be a good person, to get our way to heaven. This is describing that we can't, but God came down in the form of a human, and, and that Jesus was perfect, and he went up to the cross voluntarily for you and for me, took our sin, took our judgment upon him, was buried and rose from the dead, and we have to, all we have to do is receive. We believe what he's done for us, right, and then we become a part of the family of God, and so this is talking about a relationship that we can have with God. That God wants us to, to know that we know him. And so we see that at once Mary, well, she goes and she tells the other disciples she had seen the risen Lord Jesus. Which is interesting because among the Jews of that day, a testimony of a woman was not held in high regard. And we even see that the disciples seem to have kind of doubted her. Uh, Mary, did you really see the Lord? Did you really? And yet, I love that Jesus chose a woman to be the first to share the good news of his resurrection with. 
And we also see that the Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 records Jesus appeared to many others. Uh, he, in fact, he appeared 12 times to different groups over those next 40 days before he ascended uh, to heaven. And it wasn't just appearing to one person. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us he appeared over 500 people at once. And then again, he, would walk, he was walking the earth for 40 days, and then he ascended back into heaven. And Acts chapter 1 and 2 records that if you're interested. So what did the other disciples do with this news that Jesus is risen from the dead? Well, we see next someone comes to pay them a visit as they're uh, behind locked doors. And so we'll pick up here in verse 19, and we'll go through verse 22. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. We see in this section the disciples were fearful. Most likely fearful of the Jewish leaders. Uh, We know that Peter had had followed uh, at a distance right after Judas betrayed Jesus, that the the rest of the disciples began to scatter. And and so Peter's there and he's witnessing uh, this this mock trial, this kangaroo court that's taking place. And and people begin to ask him, hey, you're with Jesus, aren't you? You've got the accent of a Galilean. And Peter begins to deny it. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not sure what. No, you must be mistaken. And we realize that, that they're fearful, that they could be next, right? Uh, and so not only fearful uh, of, of the Jewish leaders, but they're fearful of the Romans, right? Fearful that there is going to be an uprising. And uh, the other gospel accounts record to us that the Jewish leaders come to uh, the Roman leaders and uh, and they come to, to Pontius Pilate and say, hey, this, this guy, Jesus, said that he would rise from the dead three days later. Why don't you send uh, some guards to, to make sure that, that no one can mess with the tomb? And he says, here's a guy, go and, and make it secure. And it's interesting that we see the religious leaders understood what Jesus was saying. But his disciples were still in a state of shock and disbelief, fearful. Again, they're, they're hiding behind locked doors. But we see then Jesus appears to them, and his first words, I think, are extremely important for us today as well. Peace be with you. You see, after they scattered when Jesus was taken to be crucified, the disciples probably expected the words of rebuke. This had occurred in times past where they were in a boat and Jesus is asleep, and they're freaking out. We're going to drown, and these are professional fishermen, and they're worried for their lives, and, and they finally they wake Jesus up and say, don't you care? We're about to perish. And Jesus gets up, and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and everything begins to be calm. And then he turns and rebukes his disciples and says, you little faith. He, he rebukes them for their lack of faith. And so maybe they were expecting he's going to rebuke us because we're fearful. And yet we we don't see that. We see instead Jesus brought a word of peace, restoring and encouraging peace. And this phrase, peace to you, is an assurance. There's no cause to fear. All is well. And in a sense, Jesus is making a declaration, bestowing a blessing upon them, bringing a word of peace, of restoring and encouraging peace peace to his disciples. Again, as we think about death and realize it's lingering in the back of our minds, the the statistics in the United States are are pretty firm. Uh, Ten out of ten people die. Um, I mean, it's just reality, right? Now, we were talking earlier with some of the people in the back about, hey, wouldn't that be awesome today if the Lord raptures us home? 
That'd be, that'd be awesome, right? He tells us no one knows the day or the hour. Were you expecting to be raptured on Resurrection Sunday? Maybe, maybe not. But hey, that'd be pretty cool, right? If that were to happen. Other than that, at some point, our heart's going to give out. This body, this machine, if you will, for lack of a better term, is going to break down. It's going to stop functioning, right? This tent, if you will, is what Scripture calls it. And, and the real us is going to live on forever at one point. We're going to either be with our Lord in heaven forever or apart from him in a place called hell forever. And so we realize this, that there, there is going to be more after this life. And maybe you've been fearful of death. Maybe there's a health condition you're experiencing or, or maybe you're having trouble sleeping at night because you're having uh, fear that it may be your last time right, of, of being alive. Or maybe you're, you're thinking about, if I were to pass on, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to those that I care about the most? And the enemy wants to use that fear to grip your heart and your mind, to consume you about it, uh, to get you to be discouraged and depressed. But Jesus wants you to know you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in fear. He wants to give you his peace. He wants you to have first peace with God and then the peace of God. That peace with God is what happens when we become saved. We place our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. We're no longer enemies of God. We, we're, we're reconciled, right? We're part of his family. We have peace with God. He adopts us. And then there's the peace of God that helps us to have peace with others. Again, the, this world's getting more and more crazy every day. And Lord knows we need his peace to help us uh, to be loving and peaceful to others around us. And his Holy Spirit can help us do that. And so Jesus wants you to know that there is a life after this life. You can have peace from God and peace with God. You can have hope in God that, and his peace that surpasses all understanding. And Jesus cares not only for us, but he cares for our family. Right? We can entrust our lives into his hands and know that he will do everything he can uh, to, to care for our family as well. Now we see at this point, Jesus, in verse 22, he breathes on them. And he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. There's a, an interesting point at, at the Gospel of John where he, he makes very clear mention of this, to receive the Holy Spirit. I believe at this point the disciples were truly saved. They were born again, if you will, that, that now that Christ has died for their sins, was buried and rose from the, gave, from the grave, from that dead, uh, that they can now receive the Holy Spirit and dwelling within them. They're now sealed with the Spirit. They're truly saved. Now, we realize that, that it was at this point that God gave them the Spirit to be with them and guide them. And it's a reminder for us that salvation is only possible through Jesus Christ. There's salvation in no other name. right? And if you take a look at all the, the world leaders out there, right? you look at Muhammad or Joseph Smith or, or Buddha or the past popes, you can find their grave. They're still dead. They're buried. But guess what? You go to Israel and you try to find the gravesite of Jesus, you're not going to find it. There's, there's no marker. There's, there's no tomb. There's, we can't even find the grave. Right? He was leasing it or borrowing it, if you will, from Joseph of Arimathea. And that's because Jesus is alive. He rose from the grave. He's the only one that came back from the dead. And so we want to recognize that salvation is only possible through faith in Jesus Christ. And God proved this payment for our sins was sufficient through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, you can think of it this way, that if you were to go to a store, let's say you went out to Walmart and you're going to buy one of those huge, like, what, 92-inch, you know, plasma HD television sets. If you were just to grab that and walk out of the store, well, I should rephrase that. Hopefully, if you were to walk out the store, I know some places in California, a little crazy people are doing that. But if you were to walk out the store uh, and you didn't pay for it, security guard or someone would say, hey, excuse me, excuse me, uh, 
where's your receipt? Right? They want evidence that you paid for it. And so if you truly did pay for that big screen TV, you go, oh, here's my receipt right here. I paid for it. In essence, the cross is the payment of what Christ has done for you and for me. The resurrection is the receipt. It's the proof that that payment was sufficient. And 1 Corinthians makes this very clear. If there's no resurrection, our, our faith is in vain, right? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that changes everything. And so we can recognize this. The grave had no lasting power on Jesus Christ. And if we're in Christ Jesus, the grave has no lasting power on us either. Jesus has risen from the grave. There's no fear of death or anything else. And God can give us the peace and the hope that's found in him. And I hope you know that God loves you. He wants to rescue you. He wants you to be a part of his family. And I would encourage you, don't put it off if you don't know him today. Have that peace and that hope that God wants you to have. And so in closing, we see Jesus called Mary by name. And I believe God's calling you by name as well. He wants to have that relationship with you. And I don't know your past. Maybe you were baptized as an infant. Maybe you went through confirmation. God's not going to ask about those things when you make it to heaven. He wants to know if you've put your trust in him. He wants to know if if you're his child. And sadly, there are going to be many on that day who say, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. It comes down to a relationship. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, when you get to heaven, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what we want to hear, right? We want to be faithful servants. We want to be part of his family. And so today, Jesus is calling you by name. He cares for you too. But how will you respond? Will you ignore him or will you receive him? Right, we've all got those individuals in our life that sometimes give us a call and it comes on your phone and you can swipe it to accept the call or you can swipe it the other way to reject the call. God's calling you. How are you going to respond? Are you going to accept or are you going to reject? Will you trust him or will you walk away from him? Again, when we see Jesus raised from the dead, he conquered death. I think there was an instance where the enemy thought he had won. He had defeated the plans of the Messiah, the plans of the Father, to beat Jesus on the cross. And again, the enemy wants us to be fearful of death. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us God is so powerful that he alone can beat death. He defeated our greatest enemy. And it proves again that death really is not the end. There's either eternity without God in a place called hell, or there's eternity forever with God in a place called heaven. So if you hear his voice today calling you, it's time to respond. Get right with the Lord today. Don't let one more day go by without having God's peace be with you. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the account here these eyewitnesses who testify that they came and they saw this empty tomb, that Jesus, they saw you rise from the dead. And as you came to your disciples, you showed them your hands, the holes where you'd had these nails driven through your hands and your side that the spirit pierced. And they believed. And yet you tell us, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. That's us. We believe, Lord, your word is true, that you paid for our sins upon that cross, that you were buried and rose from the dead. Lord, we pray that we would use our time wisely for your glory, to be your humble servants, to point people to you, to love you and to love others. And Lord, we pray if there be any here this morning who have yet to make that decision, yet to place their faith, their hope, and their trust in you, Oh, Lord, we ask that today would be their day of salvation. And if you're here this morning or you're watching the live stream online and you say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. I'm not living in a way that pleases the Lord. 
And I'm not certain that if I died today, I'd be with him in heaven. I don't want to go one more day without that peace you're talking about. I want assurance to know that I am a child of God, that I'm accepted, and I will be with him forever. And I want that life that you're talking about I can have here and now, a life of meaning and purpose by following Jesus. And if that's you this morning, ready to surrender to God, I want to encourage you to, to make that decision of faith, and I'll lead you in a prayer in just a moment. I'm not asking you to join Calvary Chapel. We have no official membership. I'm asking you to make sure your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you become a part of God's forever family. And so if you're ready to do that this morning, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to place your full weight of your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly mean it in your heart. God, I realize that you love me, that my sins have separated me from you. And God, I realize that you're merciful, that you want to forgive me, that you want to cleanse me. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and rose from the grave. And God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all my wrongdoing. Come into my heart and my life today. Be my Savior and my Lord. And put your spirit within me that I may do your will and follow you from this day forward. Thank you, Lord, that I can have peace and hope that endures. God, I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me and adopting me into your family. I thank you for being my king of kings and my Lord of lords. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, perhaps a rededication, coming back to him as a prodigal. Love to connect with you after service, pray with you, give you some resources, give you a Bible if you don't have one.